coming up on the Brother Henry and You Show. Henry Harris sits down with Bishop Carlton Pearson. His years on Christian television and his world-renowned Azusa Conference took him to the heights of Pentecostal charismatic circles. But a shift in theology cost him everything. I believe people go through hell, not ultimately to hell. The church that adored him rejected him. You come in there telling us we are wrong and you are right. It's false doctrine you preach. And the world embraced him. My next guest has faced many trials, but he's a perfect example of one who never wavers in his belief, despite the cost. Please welcome Bishop Carlton Pearson. With Netflix even making a movie about his spiritual journey. No more shame and misery. People have been saying that I stopped believing in hell. I heard a voice say, everyone's already saved. No, no, you can't just rewrite the Bible. I'm not rewriting anything, I'm just rereading it. You speak the word of God in this church. That God loves us all. Carlton Pearson. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. If he didn't condemn, why do we? That's all I'm saying. From hero to heretic and back again. And it's all coming up next on the Brother Henry and You Show. You're watching the Brother Henry and You Show. Engaging. Informative. Inspirational. Enjoy today's program. In five, four, three, two. Welcome to the Brother Henry and You Show. I am your host, Henry Harris. It's such an honor to be here today, and I'm so excited that you've taken this opportunity to watch. Today, we have a phenomenal guest. In my mind, he's awesome, he's amazing. He's even a legend um, in my heart, and his name is Bishop Carlton Pearson, and I, God bless you. Thank you. Henry. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Pleasure. And today we're going to talk about uh, his movie uh, called Come Sunday. He's actually the man behind the story. So Bishop, thank you so much for this opportunity, being on the show. Today is such an honor. Thank you. As I've told you earlier, I've always been inspired by you, uh, even when I was a kid. And I just think it's an amazing opportunity to be able to sit with you today and talk about your movie. Thank you. So I want to start out with this question. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your upbringing. Well, based on what I know about you, my upbringing, first of all, thank you for wanting me on your show and uh, making the, the trip to come to Tulsa the city. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> My background is pretty much like yours, classical Pentecostalism, just like your dad as a pastor, mine was, and his dad was a pastor. Mm -hmm. On my mother's side, my great-grandfather, so that's four generations of classical pew-jumping, devil-thumping, bible quoting, <laughs> <laughs> preaching, uh, which was transcendent for me. Yeah. And then I came here to Tulsa in 1971, right out of high school to attend the Oral Roberts University, which I did for five and a half years. Then I went to work for Oral Roberts uh, for another five years and then I, well I stayed with the board for 16, the Board of Regents, so he was my mentor from 71 pretty much till he expired in the, at 91 years old. Mm -hmm. And I pastored here in this city and um, traveling all over the world and you probably know about the Azusa Conference which I we do. held here for 15 yeah, years. Yeah, I do. And um, after all that, I had a shift in theological references and I, uh, I stopped believing that just Christians were saved, but that the whole world through Christ had been re redeemed to God, that all sin and sinners were atoned for in mm -hmm. the blood. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was saying, my work of redemption, the work of redemption is completed. Mm -hmm. The mission is accomplished. Now you who believe that, go tell the world. 
give them the good news that the bad news is all wrong. Yeah. That any issue that would have been between humanity and God or God and humanity was resolved at the cross with the Christ. That God, scripture, was in Christ reconciling the world, not just the church or some Jews, but the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. That's good news. Yes, that's good news. <laughs> that's the best news. And we're all in trouble if that's not true. So if God doesn't hold men or human sins against them, why do we in the church tend to do so? We, get, we build whole religions around blaming people mm -hmm. and holding their sins against them when the good news is there are no sins that haven't been atoned for, so everybody should rejoice. Mm -hmm. That's true Pentecostalism. That's amazing. I've often said <laughs> that many churches, uh, perhaps preachers, uh, that's all they do just about every Sunday. They're reminding you of something that supposedly God no longer remembers. Right. So I don't see no good news in that. Yeah. But uh, my next question is, uh, can you describe your early days of ministry to us? How was that like? Well, I started because of my association with the church. I mean, church, probably the same with you when you were a kid, that's all we did. Mm -hmm. We didn't recreate other than that. Uh, my, but my dad did take us to the beach. We, we lived in California. And, you know, we'd go on rides and hike in the mountains and stuff like that. But everything was church. And I started feeling the inclination toward the ministry when I was around five or six years old. Mm -hmm. Started playing church, my two little sisters. And... Uh, I would be the preacher and I couldn't even read. <laughs> I had a little dusty Bible that I found and I was very into religion, more than any of the six kids in my mom and dad's house. We, there were seven, the first one died uh, almost at birth. So I started playing church and then I got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost still when I was like, before I was eight years old, all of that. And I started, they called the little preacher boy, so they had me testifying and preaching. I really couldn't preach. Mm -hmm. I was just talking. But <laughs> they, uh, they could, boy, the hand of the Lord's on you, son. God's going to use you, that kind of thing. And he did. And I went through all of junior, uh, of uh, elementary school. I was a student body president, the leader. Mm -hmm. And then um, in junior high, I was the eighth grade president, class president. And then junior high, I was a student body president. And I was leading people to Christ the whole time, preaching the whole time, singing to my mom's choirs. All the choirs, very close to Bishop J. A. Blake, who's a, whose son is the presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. The first 18 years of my life, I was totally involved in the local church because on both sides of the family, there were preachers and churches and Sunday school and YBWW, which is young people with the work. My grandmother was the president of that, my mother's side. So I pretty much was indoctrinated and entrenched. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And very happy, by the way. I never hated holiness. I loved the church. I loved Jesus, loved the Holy Ghost, loved worship, would rather be at church than anywhere on the planet, mm. which wasn't the case with all of my siblings. But um, it wasn't something I dreamed up. It just happened. God, as those saints had had his hand on me. Mm -hmm. So, and then when I came here in 18 year, at 18 years old, Bishop Blake, J.A. Blake in San Diego ordained me before I came to Tulsa. I was licensed at 15, ordained at 18, so uh, and was traveling, preaching in and around Tulsa for the whole time I was at ORU. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about your experience being asked to leave your church. I believe of what, five, 6,000? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that, that must have been a painful experience for you, um, especially through all those dark days. How did you bounce back? How does anyone bounce back from having everything that, that they have to being ex basically excommunicated from all of that. Interestingly, we use the term bouncing back. The, the, you never, nobody ever stays up. If you're bouncing, you go up and you always come back yeah. down. And you don't end up, you end down. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I didn't actually, I wasn't asked to leave the church. The mm -hmm. church just left me. The, the people just left by the droves. We had, um, 30 acres of property and multi-million dollars worth of buildings and a 645-acre ranch and uh, Azusa Credit Union and Azusa Music and, you know, a lot. Um, but the people panicked when mm -hmm. it looked like I was in error. They just left it slowly and slowly. We ended up, by the time we had to sell the church, I sold it about 1,200 members, but only four or 500 were coming. That got number down, got down to like 300. Mm. 
I never believed the most painful thing in all of that was losing the property in the church. I never thought that would happen because we got it miraculously. God, it was, I, mean, I can't even tell you how we ended up with that property. I know I saw it. The next thing I knew I was in it. In 30 days, I needed to get in. I had no collateral. That, that will always be a mystery to me. But I was busy trusting, busy obeying, busy doing what I do. And we ended up with the church. So we had had one, a little storefront prior to, uh, to that, and I lost that building. It was a $400,000 deal that we had lost. And we were on the street for about a month with no place to, to minister, and except Billy Joe Doherty, one of my friends in the Victory Christian Center here, now pastored by Paul Doherty, uh, his son, because Billy Joe's transitioned to heaven. We used their spot out here. We used their property. I had uh -huh. about 900 people at that time. And then in, within a month, we ended up with that building, um, which we um, renovated and added another 40,000 square foot um, building to it and expanded the property another 15 acres and what have you, and it just grew like that. Um, so I bounced up and down and bounced up, and I, you end up back on the ground where you started. And, and you have to use the same faith, the same trust, the same hope on ground level that you did when you started however many years ago. There has been many people by the thousands who have accused you of saying that there is no hell. Uh, is there a way you can clarify the meaning of that? Or can you explain your beliefs about that uh, further? Well, the, the actual English word hell, as we understand the term, does not appear in scripture anywhere. Mm -hmm. There's a difference in translating, interpreting, translating, and transliterating using the letter or letters mm -hmm. of the alphabet of the language that the scriptures were written in, which is Hebrew, uh, and then Greek. Jesus never used the word hell. He used the word Gehenna. Ge meaning gully or gorge or valley of Hinnom, the sons of Hinnom, which had been existing at least 500 years before Jesus because of the reference to it in the book of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. So it was a literal place. It was a, it was the city dump on the southeast corner of Jerusalem, the old city, and I've been there at least 12 times. And now it's picnic benches and, you know, parking palm trees and all that beautiful stuff. But it physically existed, and it never went out because people were throwing carcasses of dead animals, all their trash, uh, carcasses of, of non-Jewish people and non-Roman citizens were there, burnt theirs. So that's what Jesus was referring to when he said the fire doesn't go out and the worm doesn't die, yeah. the maggot. Well, now the fire is out and the worm is dead because it hasn't <laughs> been there for at least 2,000 years. So that place doesn't exist. We have, we, have, we have literalized something that he meant metaphorically or metaphysically as being the burning agony of, of being or feeling distant from God mm -hmm. or away from God. To preach um, a eternal damnation where people are doomed or condemned or damned forever is has grown over the years to become a, a monstrous um, deception mm -hmm. to a lot of people. Now, when you believed in it, and believers, mm -hmm. particularly Christians, are so devoted to hell and to a devil or a demon or a legitimate nemesis to an almighty God. Now remember the term is almighty. Mm -hmm. Omniscient, though the Bible doesn't say that, but all knowing, everywhere present, omnipresent, and omnipotent or almighty, all potential, all powerful God. An all powerful God who dwells everywhere and knows everything, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't be worried about hell. It wouldn't even create one. But over the years, fear-based theologies has created this aberration uh, of God and made that God monstrous. And the God of the Bible is monstrous. Mm -hmm. The God of the Bible is mean. The God of the Bible is vengeant. The God of the Bible is jealous. The God of the Bible says, I regret that I made you. I repent. I, I don't want you. My spirit's not going to strive with you always because you're human and I don't deal with you mortality. Mm -hmm. So that's an arrogant God and a, a condescending God. Narcissistic. Narcissistic God, very much like 
Donald Trump. Yeah. That's a whole other subject. You can raise that wherever you want to. Uh, but that's why so many evangelicals follow Trump. Yeah. Uh, because the, he reminds them of the angry, uh, mean-spirited God mm -hmm. of the Bible. And I hate to say I'm a Bible scholar. I, yeah. mean, I, I majored in biblical literature, English Bible, theology and historical studies was my minor. And I preached out of that Bible for 50 years. I still do. I read it almost or quoted nearly daily, pretty much daily. I don't make any decisions or evaluations without thinking about Scripture, not always intentionally. I just habitually think about it. But I care enough about it to study it thoroughly, do the research, and found out that the Bible is an important book. I take it seriously, just not always literally. If you're a biblical literalist and the Bible itself says the letter, meaning the literal, mm -hmm. kills. If you are a literalist, it's dead. But if you're spiritual, you see the metaphors and the metaphysical approach, you see the allegories, you see the figurative in there, you see the Bible suggesting things um, that we have literalized and it makes it a very difficult book to appreciate. So, um, the whole idea of, of um, and, and initially I believed in hell, I just didn't believe anybody would be in it because of the blood, mm -hmm. because of Jesus. Uh, as in Adam, all men die, scripture says, so in Christ, all will be made alive. So if Buddhists, Hindus, agnostics, atheists all die because of the first Adam, mm -hmm. why can that same group all live because of the last Adam? Jesus is called the last Adam. So more, more folks, including believers, have more faith in the first Adam mm -hmm. and his death sentence to humanity than they do in the last Adam and his life sentence. Mm. So the goodness of, or the gospel is the good news of the life sentence that Jesus gives humanity. And he was wounded for our transgressions. Mm -hmm. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace or the punishment with God was upon him mm -hmm. and by his stripes we are healed that's Old Testament mm -hmm. so um, when you theologically or scripturally if you want to argue scripture I would I would win mm -hmm. just with uh, the scriptures affirming the lordship of Christ mm -hmm. or the redemptive finished work to tell us that in Greek mission accomplished the finished work of the cross he said it is finished, and the church folks said, oh no, hell no, it ain't finished. It <laughs> yeah. ain't finished till we say it's finished. Yeah. You go down in his name or in the Trinity, or you join yeah. my church, or pay time <laughs> to my ministry, or believe my particular doctrinal interpretation. So it's in your face. I'm dealing with 2,000 years of entrenched indoctrination. I know it's difficult. You can't turn an ocean liner around on a dime. It takes a long time, and as big as Christianity is to turn slowly or an 18 wheeler to turn a corner without getting in somebody's lane or maybe hitting somebody. Mm -hmm. So trying to turn it the way I have, even to turn me, it took years before I spoke out on my disdain. But it wasn't until the NBC Dateline special came on and they said he lost this, he lost that, his ministry, his church, not because he was unfaithful to his wife or not because he embezzled money, but because he stopped believing in hell. That's crazy. Oh, I said, dude, <laughs> I, I don't, you got me in worse trouble. That's crazy. Uh, but eventually, uh, that's when then they built the movie around a guy that stopped believing in hell. So that has become the emphasis. Bishop Preston don't believe in hell. What if we don't believe in hell? What do we need Jesus for? And we got to have Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if we don't believe in Jesus, everybody going to hell. You know, so, uh, but we've been taught that. We don't even, we can't even prove that the man that they called Christ, whose name was Jesus, which is Joshua in Hebrew, mm -hmm. never really existed except in scriptures. And then the Bible is completely silent on him for 18 years from age 12 to 30. We don't know where he was, what mm -hmm. he was doing. There's not even a hint. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying he didn't exist because I believe in Jesus. I mean, he's my, my savior, my Lord, my friend, my mentor. It, when, when you're talking Christian lingo. Yeah. I no longer believe I need to be saved by God from God. Because mm -hmm. that's what Christianity really is. Yeah. We need Jesus to protect us from God. Yeah. Uh, but I understand the, the mentality because my dad and his dad and his dad, I mean, we, I get it. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm in that bubble as you referred to earlier before we were on camera. There was a bubble in there, but I could see, even it was a little blur, but I could see outside the bubble. I knew I was in the bubble. And I was getting claustrophobic in there. 
the air was getting thinner. The oxygen was, it took 50 years for me to finally bust out of that bowl and say, free at last, free at last. Thank, Thank God, God Almighty. Almighty. Free, free at last. last. <laughs> well, Bishop Cardin, what a horrible transaction. I mean, I often think about hell. It's almost like a threat. It is. Uh, if you really think about it, give your life to Jesus or else this is what's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. I've always had issues with that. And uh, you've helped uh, bring a lot of clarity, even in my life, in regards to that subject. Sure. That it almost makes us look more merciful as human beings it does. than God himself, who says he's all merciful. Right. And I've heard you say quite a few times that Maybe you could say it again. How can mercy endure yeah. forever? And torture, one would cancel out the other. Yeah. And I vote for mercy. The scripture clearly says his mercy, referring to God, endures forever. Well, how can, I mean, you have brothers, you yeah. have parents, you have a little daughter. If one of them backslid or never confessed Christ, you'd go to heaven supposedly and walk around heaven all day. Mm -hmm. And if your daughter was backslidden or your dead backslid or somebody was never saved, never gave their heart to Christ, they would be in hell in your mind. Mm -hmm. Now, unless you've lost all sense of emotion or compassion in heaven, uh, you, you can't enjoy it as much. Yeah. If, if, you're, if you think a member of your family uh, is, is being tortured. And I remember the Holy Ghost saying to me, to use our typical Pentecostal language, do you really believe what you're preaching? Mm -hmm. That we're going to torture everybody infinitely? Do you think you're more benevolent than we are? Would you send yours? My son, Julian, who's now 25, was crawling around my feet. Just, And mm -hmm. I was so proud that I had a son. Mm -hmm. That I had been married at 40. He's uh, 41 now. I got a kid. I mean, I got a son. I'm freaked out. Thanking God and feeling a little guilty because I stopped being single and <laughs> decided to be a common married man that with a job. You mm -hmm. know, that. That mentality was, for, for me, it was like condescending. Mm -hmm. That I'm up here going to be like Paul and Jesus, who's never married, we thought, we think, and walk on water and cast out every devil. And, he was like, and I was involved in all that. So now my kid's here, and I'm feeling slightly guilty, but also incredibly proud. And I heard God say in my heart, what could that little boy do to make you send him to hell forever? Hmm. He said, what could your son do? He said, what could that little boy? And I was almost worshiping that little boy. And I said, without hesitation, not the slightest hesitation, absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I could never send my kid to hell. I don't care what he did. I might put him through hell <laughs> for doing it. Yeah. But I couldn't send him there to, to live forever. And that's when I heard God say, well, what makes you think we will? Are you more, are you more benevolent, more loving, more merciful than, than us or me? And I said, well, of course not. Then why are you telling people what you're telling them? And that really that landed on in my consciousness it's like, bam! Why are you telling people that's not good news? That's <laughs> not gospel? Mm -hmm. To tell people they're going to hell or that God is mean enough to even send them. That's more like a demon. Yeah. With Hitler, at least the people, after really a few seconds, a few minutes, stopped breathing and stopped burning mm -hmm. and couldn't feel the pain. But with God, see that the Lord be confirming my word. <laughs> and but with God, yeah. it's like you're gonna. T I could never. I don't know you well enough. I met you this morning, but there's nothing you could do, including burn my house down and, and destroy my kids, which I would kill you first before yeah. God. But I wouldn't want you to to, to be infinitely tortured because I'd figure there's something wrong with your mind, mm -hmm. and or that you're just mentally deranged and need help. I'd want to stop you. And I would stop you. Uh, I would die or kill for my children. My mother's in there, she's 90 years old almost. That's just common thinking. But to, I would send none of them anywhere forever. I don't have that capacity to be that angry and unforgiving. Yeah. And I try to make people think, why, what God mm -hmm. would even think of taking a 16 year old kid or a 66 year old man or woman and torturing them forever and way up in heaven? praising God, mm -hmm. when billions of people are weeping, wailing, that, that's, that's obscene, it's absurd, it's obscure. But we bought into it, and it has caused a, a global psychosis, a mental illness, and, it, and out of that mentality comes the Hitlers and the hate or the hurtlers, and there could be one in all of us. So 
I try to make people just rethink what you believe, why you believe it, how those beliefs add to or subtract from the quality of your life. Why do you think people preach hell? And uh, it's going to be two questions in one. Why do you think people preach hell? And why do you think people hold on to the ideal of hell? Like, why do you think that's one of those subjects that I just can't let go? Well, for the same reason my, my aunt who the bird we say, it's in the Bible. The Bible is right. I, you know, the Bible is a corrupted book. Mm -hmm. And it took 300 years to canonize it. It was mass produced until 14, 1,400 years after Christ, and that's with the Gutenberg Press. Mm -hmm. And he was tortured for doing that. Um, it's a dangerous book. I love it, I teach it, I read it, I've studied it, but it's very dangerous because uh, uh, slavery is supported by scripture. Mm -hmm. Demeaning women is supported by scripture. Not only capital punishment, even though the Bible says thou shalt not kill, God tells Moses, and Moses tells his people, after they came off the mountain and they worshiped the golden calf, go find your brother or father, anybody that, that uh, worshiped the golden calf, kill them, just stab them. And they did, 3,000 people died that day. Mm. Uh, there are times in scripture when the Old Testament, God tells the children of Israel to kill every male, female, child, animal, kill them all. And yet thou shalt not kill is one of the 10 commandments. But they, there was death and murder around this whole angry God. So we, when you've been taught that, and in, it's been entrenched in the culture and consciousness for, for at least 2,000 years, uh, we don't know anything else but to preach that. Mm -hmm. And it's irresponsible not to preach about hell. If you believe in it and believe people who don't believe in Jesus are going there, you need to warn them. So tell them, tell them, tell them about Jesus. Because if you don't think going to hell, and if you don't tell them, you're going to hell. Yeah. And if you tell it wrong, you're going through hell. Mm -hmm. So I believe everybody goes through hell, but nobody goes to hell and stays. That, to me, is just absurd. It is. It truly is. If you could go back in time, knowing how everything played out in your life, would you do the same thing the same way again? I'd probably do it similarly. I wouldn't do it exactly the same, but at the time, I don't know, because what I was doing when I was doing it was the best I knew. I was doing it the way my parents and grandparents and godparents and all them, and the way I thought Oral, whom I worked with Robert for 40 years, he was like a second cousin to the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. to me. Um, I, I, uh, I wasn't as smart, but I was very ambitious mm -hmm. and I probably would have shifted a few things around, but basically, um, I'd have my church paid also when everybody left, I would still have it. <laughs> I, uh, and I would have taken better care of myself, mm -hmm. physically and monetarily. But I never thought I would ever lose my whole church and my income and my thousands of followers, many of whom I had bonded to in baptism, bonded to in communion, bonded to in marital cer uh, ceremonies, in, uh, in fasting and praying together every January for 21 days and getting on our face for 21 days and throughout the year and counseling and we built so much together for each other. It was inconceivable. And I knew I wasn't gonna be unfaithful to my wife or do something dumb, mm -hmm. uh, quote unquote sinful. Uh, it's just I shifted the theology and I got in trouble just because I said the gospel is so good it's hard to believe. Mm -hmm. The good news is so good that it's hard to believe and God loves more than we think he does. He got me in trouble. Mm -hmm. You've been called a heretic, an apostate. There's been many people saying you're leading people to hell uh -huh. or leading people astray. There's even been others who have claimed that you're under some type of strong delusion. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your response to your critics? Well, they're right. They, they, I am an apostate. It, the word apostate actually means runaway slave. Most people don't know that. I was a slave to religion and I ran away. Yeah. I'm, I'm part of the great falling away. Mm -hmm. But I haven't fallen from grace. I fell into grace out of religion, mm -hmm. out of legal bondage. Um, I, I'm complimented when they say he's leading millions. <laughs> I stopped right there. They, he's leading millions to hell. I'm leading millions out of hell consciousness. Yeah. Out of sin consciousness. 
So, uh, but I, I'm not offended by those supposedly slanderous references because I understand the mentality behind it. Mm -hmm. I would have said the same thing about you if I was in the same mindset. I would say it about anybody that deviated from the, the word trade. Tradition means to trade it down. And heresy is means opinion or choice that is not in the popular trend. So I wear heretic, heretic proudly like a medal, like something I achieved. Mm -hmm. It takes, takes guts. You, 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 you cannot be a coward and be free. Yeah. Freedom is not for cowards. So the scripture says, Paul says to Timothy, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. He used the word dahlia, which means cowardice or timidity. You're not intimidated, but of power, love, sound mind, King, which means self-discipline. So I'm, uh, it hurts, and, but it doesn't harm me. Um, it affected me, the disdain of the people, but it didn't infect me. And it really didn't defect me. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're more miserable than I am. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. He's going to hell. And it's this terrible thing. Yeah, it's fell. harsh, though. Know. Yeah. It's harsh. And it makes them question God. God, why would you let one of our best, because they thought I was one of their best. Mm -hmm. Carlton Pearson, we've listened to his music and his Azusa conference, and he introduced people to the body of Christ. He brought the body of Christ together. He's bringing blacks and whites together. How would you let him, why would you lose? God, can't you even keep your best? Yeah. People think that God lost a third of heaven. It mm -hmm. just says the dragon, mm -hmm. his tail. Draconian is, comes to the word dragon. It means a binding law, legalistic approach, mm -hmm. draconian thought that a third of the stars were scraped out of the sky. We assume that God lost a third of his angels. The scripture never says that. Mm -hmm. But if he did, that means that God can even keep heaven together. <laughs> I never looked at it that uh, way. It's talking about war in heaven. So, wait a minute, I, I'm, that's why I'm supposed to walk around heaven all day and sing to Jesus. And you tell me there's stuff up there. Mm -hmm. If Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, interceding, for the saints. That means, even though he said my work is finished and he's gone back to heaven, he's still praying to the God who he's sitting beside. Yeah. Saying, please take care of those saints. They're crazy, they're stupid, they're backwards, they, they, they're, they're victims. Uh, I'm interceding for the saints, God, not the rest of the world. I died for the rest of the world, but I'm interceding for the saints because the saints are gonna get tortured or tormented. Is, what are you interceding? Are you asking God to protect us from Nero, who killed millions, mm -hmm. including Paul? beheaded him, mm -hmm. had Peter crucified upside down, supposedly. Um, what is the concern in heaven? And if there is a concern in heaven, both on God and Jesus' part, then that's not the place of absolute peace. Mm -hmm. There's a battle going on. There's some cosmic conflict that hasn't been resolved, even after Jesus. So the whole, the whole theology is twisted and contorted. And I'm saying that we need to rethink what we believe and why we believe it. Because a lot of those beliefs have messed up our minds. It's torn families up. Kids don't speak to their parents. They run away from the church by the millions over the years. Sometimes they come back at the end because they're kind of half scared. Or once they have kids, they say, well, at least I don't want them to go to hell. Yeah. You know, there's fear. Those are what I call fear-based theologies and faith-biased theologies. And they're not good for us. My last question is, what are your thoughts and <clears throat> plans for the future? Um, I want to be a part of a global shift in religious sensibilities. I want to help trigger people to repent, which means rethink, mm -hmm. metanoia, to change their mind, to think again, to reconsider, or after you have thought, think again. John Baptist came preaching that, and so did Jesus. Repent, rethink. But the kingdom of God is at hand. There's a kingdom of goodness or godness that's right in front of us, but we won't enjoy it or enter it or experience it if we don't rethink how stuck we are in religion. Mm -hmm. The whole Catholic Church is under global indictment and scrutiny mm -hmm. because of the deception and delusions that were taught. Um, the church in America is strained. Mm -hmm. um, 
The average attendance is 100 across the board. There's a few mega churches, but compared to the tens of thousands of normal churches, they're mostly older people anymore, mm -hmm. and young people are not relating to it. They don't get it. They're not into it at all. They don't believe it. Um, there's about 1,500 churches that close in this country every month. About 1,500, 1, 1,500 people leaving the church every day. Uh, it's not working. Mm -mm. And what really blessed us in the 20th century, Pentecost, uh, Protestantism, it doesn't work as well in the 21st century. I can't tell you all the reasons why, but the flourishing zeal, our country's mentality and consciousness is shifting. Everybody doesn't believe in this God. They don't fear that God. Uh, you've got multiracial, multicultural marriages. You've got same gender loving people on television. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got couples standing there to, pregnant with three kids saying, we're thinking about getting married. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a movie star or an, or an athlete or some celebrity. So our kids, yours and mine, and their kids are looking at a world that's different mm -hmm. than the one we grew up in. Mm -hmm. And I'm a lot older than you. So your parents, I'm older than your parents. Yeah. But they would remember a lot of the same things we remember. This is not the same America. This is not the same world. And we need to adjust our message and our ministries, if you're going to have one, to the world in which we live. My phone says iPhone I, and has an iPad in the iCloud and it has an apple on it with a bite out of it. Hmm. They done ate the tree, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good. <laughs> What's his name? Who started the apple thing? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. He was a Zen Buddhist. But when he died, devastated by cancer, he came to this planet put that Apple phone and all that, those products in our hands, and a billion, billions of people now can see the same thing, hear the same thing, or similar things. Uh, his last three comments when he died is, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. Now I thought he would be screaming and tormented and torturous, tortured because he's going to hell. He was a Zen Buddhist, and he was saying, oh wow, whatever he saw as he exited, those are the last three statements before he, he breathed his last breath. He saw something that was wowing and awe-inspiring, not awful, awesome. Mm -hmm. So that is another proof, uh, an earthly proof that whatever he transitioned to was better than, he was, than what he was transitioning out of. So that's, that, that doesn't prove anything except there, it may not be held the way we think. I just don't believe in that, that, that twisted, contorted concept. It's very destructive to the human consciousness and the human culture. Mm -hmm. And about 4 billion of the 7.8 on the planet who are Muslims and Christians and Jews believe in that God that hates, that'll kill you, cut you, mm -hmm. torture you, go and get your boy. God will get you, boy. I heard that all my life. Oh, yeah, me too. And the, the devil will get you. The devil will get us. So both of them will get us. God will get us, and the devil will get us. It almost seems like um, at times the devil and God is kind of like co working. I know it. It's like, for example, if somebody is sick, they're praying to Jesus to get healed, but at the same time, God gave them cancer. Yeah. It's like. Or God, why would I even have to? That would be like my kids begging me. To take care of them. Yeah. Begging me to protect them, me to protect them. Mm -hmm. They gotta worship me before breakfast every morning. Yeah. They gotta and lunch and dinner. And come in here telling me thank you, Daddy, from this house. Thank you for work. I said, boy, if you say thank you one more time, I'm gonna slap you. <laughs> Get out of my face. You know I love you. Uh-huh. Just tell me you love me every so and often. I'll tell you, you know I love you. But we don't need you don't need to worship me. I think God would be bothered, a real God, a benevolent God, would be worried with all this constant and you can't think anything. Mm -hmm. Negro, <laughs> eat and be glad. Yeah. Get out of my face. Thank yeah. me every once in a while if you want to, but don't just, you make me feel like a thing. Yeah. And that's, I want a relationship with you. Yeah. I don't thank my mother every time I see her. I kiss her a lot mm -hmm. and I embrace her, but not all day long. You know, that would make her say, that's enough, son. I got the point. See? So I think we worry God with some of that stuff. Whatever God is out there. And it's the one in the Bible. You don't worry him. He wants it all. He wants all the praise and all the glory. Mm -hmm. And he's jealous of any other God. And he's, he says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Vindictive. He's vindictive and angry and uh, remorseless and 
admitted he wanted a divorce from us. So I went out of here. And then he drowned everybody on the planet, except for Noah and his wife and kids. And then Noah comes out of the ark and has some kind of incestuous relationship with his son mm -hmm. in a drunken stupor. And, and uh, then God gets discouraged again and says, oh, these... I just cleaned the whole planet up, and this dude comes out of the ark <laughs> and, and, and messes up again. And so he said, the water didn't work. Next time we're going to burn, we're going to use fire. <laughs> in, in my mind, it's just not, logically, it's just not making sense. No, it ain't supposed to. I'm glad that, and see, you're one of, uh, of millions of smarter, curious, suspecting young people who are saying, you know what, this doesn't mesh. Mm -hmm. It doesn't settle them. There's something wrong with this. And you have to look back at your mom and dad and say, I hate to say this, mom and dad, because I love you. Yeah. But I, I think your you're, you're thinking is a bit twisted. Now, mm -hmm. that you, you might get a whipping for that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, oh, would. Yeah, yeah, grown whooping. But it's like, that's not, that's just where you guys are. <clears throat> yeah. And oh, I'm, I'm proud of you. Well, thank you. I've often said that I appreciate the people that have taught me growing up. I think they're well-meaning people. They just have the wrong mindset. Yeah. And um, yeah. as you said earlier, they just need to rethink, reconsider, maybe revisit some of those things that we've been taught in order to operate mm -hmm. uh, in a greater freedom yeah. within our inner self. Great. So I think you're amazing. You are too, Henry. Thank you so much. I like for your this. mind. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. For more information about Bishop Cardin Pearson, you can visit www.cardinpearson.com. He's also um, on Facebook under Cardin D. Carlton D. Put a D yeah. in there, Pearson. Uh -huh. Cardin D. Pearson on Facebook.com, and I believe you're on Instagram and Twitter as well. Yes. Appreciate you guys from watching. Share this video. If you have not seen the movie Come Sunday, uh, visit Netflix.com, and many of you probably have Netflix on your TV. Go there right now and watch Come Sunday. I want you to know that you will not be disappointed. God bless you. Have a great week. All right, here we go. All right, my